Laura Meyer, founder and CEO of Amazon Solutions Provider, Envision Horizon. And I'm Todd Pachowski, Director of Performance Marketing at Envision Horizons. We've teamed up to make the Common Mistakes podcast. Todd and I meet with business owners, leaders, and investors to discuss common mistakes and other business experiences they've learned from. Tune in every other Tuesday for your dose of business advice. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Common Mistakes, where we talk about mistakes we've made, we've seen, so you don't have to learn the hard way. I'm Laura Meyer. And I'm Todd Pachowski, Director of Performance Marketing at Vision Horizons. Today we have John Cavendish. I hope I got the the last name right there. Former seven-figure Amazon seller. He's founder of Seller Candy. Seller Candy is is a great agency, acts as a technical arm of your Amazon business, does a lot of cool things between you and seller support. No more templated resources, no more complicated POAs or being bounced between departments. And uh, I'm sure a lot more, which John will get into today. So John, thanks thanks for coming on and uh, look forward to this conversation. Thank you for having me. Really good to be here virtually. Yes. Well, it's it's our pleasure to chat with you today. As I think anyone who's ever sold on Amazon knows, especially if you're in Seller Central, but even on Vendor, dealing with Amazon support can make you want to pull your hair out. <laughs> and I want to get into some of the mistakes and best practices you've come across along the way. But as a serial entrepreneur and an EO member, I have to open it up with my standard question, which is if you can share a mistake you've made that really stands out to you in your career, that today you're, you're, you come to terms with it, you're glad it happened because you learned such a valuable lesson and if you can share what that lesson was. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> like a dollar count, maybe like... We have like one of those dollar dollar meters that goes up, blows yeah. out the top. <laughs> I would say like one of the biggest mistakes, well, one of the biggest mistakes that's cost me the most amount of money. It's kind of a general thing, but it's a specific outcome. So my first Amazon business, uh, we did really well, launched, and then we grew very quickly. We were doing a um, couple of like million and a half dollars revenue within the first kind of 18 months. And my friend was selling his business to a broker that bought supplement company. So it was a supplement company. Then I had a supplement company as well. So I talked to this guy, he was going to buy the business for a million dollars cash. I was like, that sounds good. I'd love a million dollars cash because I'd run this thing for mistake number one, like a cash machine because I didn't have any money when I started the business. So I hadn't really scaled it properly. I hadn't reinvested the profits properly. I just used it to actually make some money because I had like 20 grand in my bank account when I started out this first business or less. So mistake after that mistake, uh, I was selling this business to this guy. And at the same time, I decided I wanted to start another business. So I kind of taken my focus off this business that's being sold. It was nearly through anyway, and started working on this kind of agency model, which I decided I wanted to go into. And then two weeks before it was going to going to close, it falls through. And I'm like, oh, no. So now I've got this business, which I'm not really managing very well. I've got this other thing that's going, spinning all these plates. The business does, does all right. You know, it still does over a million dollars revenue next year. But that's the start of a kind of a slow decline as the European supplement market gets more and more saturated and supplements get more saturated in general. You know, I I exited it later for a lot less money. Yeah, my big lesson is, I guess, either sell on the way up or focus on the one thing, like keep the one thing, the one thing, no, no more distractions. By the way, that is a learning and a theme that has actually come up on multiple episodes at this mm. point. And we're still season one, technically. <laughs> So I, I think that's a lesson every entrepreneur learns the hard way because it's, I, I think, especially as entrepreneurs, you have that drive and you get excited about different concepts. And it's so easy to look at the next shiny thing instead of you know being strict with yourself to focus on that one thing. Completely. And that was my theme for 2021 was focus. I try and have a theme for each year. Uh, like theme 2021 focus because cut everything else just do this and it was crazy yeah we grew we like 5x that year what's the 2022 focus or uh word of the year uh, leadership okay. so focus was a massive driver of growth in 2021 but it held i thought like it held me back a lot as well because i just focused like i was mean, in lockdown i got up at 6 a.m i started working <laughs> worked all day then calls with the us in the evening because i'm in asia so basically i just worked 
during lockdown, like 16 hours a day. I didn't really do much health stuff. I didn't really hang out with my wife, well, hang out with my wife, with my wife, because we were both locked in the same apartment. Without leadership, I can't, you know, we hit the, the limit of what I could grind. So my theme of 2022 became leadership. And then weirdly, everything seemed to line up with that theme. Like I got a leadership coach. I went to a lot of leadership events. I went to EO leadership events. So everything kind of seemed to line up with that. I would love to learn a little bit more about your experience hiring a coach because this is something that I've been adverse to for a while. I get all these LinkedIn messages of all these people claiming to be coaches, and I think it's all snake oil, I'm not gonna lie. I would love to learn more about your journey and maybe mistakes you've made along the way and vetting the right coach and what that process has been like. I, I agree, and that's a, a big one for me, because I think I make, the big, I make the distinction between coaches and mentors, I guess. Like coaches being a person that's a reflector, someone who's a really good people person who helps me or helps anyone like connect with why they're doing it, understand motivation and get your head in the right space. And then a mentor as someone who's walked the path before and, you know, said so these are the steps along the path and this is what you got to watch out for. But those people aren't, in my experience, necessarily the best coaches. They're just like, you should do this right now because this is what's going to happen which is, you know, which is great, but it's different from helping us to be on the path. So with that in mind, I was looking for a coach in December last year, because I'd had a sales coach for a year, the year before it was really more of a mentor, you know, he'd taken us from 15k a month to 80k a month in the full service agency. And I wanted a leadership coach, I was browsing through Facebook, and following, it was Ryan Moran, he posted something freedom, the uh, capitalism.com guy about I'm looking for a coach, obviously, as you say, a million people are commented underneath like, I'm a coach, you should talk with this coach, this coach. So I went through and started clicking on all the links. I can send you a link to that post if you want. And you can just look through all the different coaches. It's like a coach Rolodex now. And I found this guy, which I really resonated with his values. I did a lot of Tony Robbins in the last few years. And like, these are my values. I really resonate with who this guy wants to be as like, you know, a heart led leader and what he's done. He, he's, you know, been a professional CEO of like five companies in the fortune starting the Inc. 5000. His achievements worked, his values worked. Then when I talked to him, he's you know an amazing coach. Like he can put his ego aside and listen to my, my uh, BS. And it's great, you know, you meet those people sometimes. Did you know immediately upon engagement with him that it was the right fit or was it something that took time? I would assume a coach tells you a lot of things that you don't want to hear, a good coach. Was that the case or was it all gravy from the get-go and you were happy? And, and not being pushed from, from that angle. I think the more people I talk to and the more people I hire and work with, the more I like having a read for, do I know, like, and trust this person immediately? So yeah, I mean, I knew, like, and trust him immediately. And I just like, I think his communication style fits mine, that he is very different from me. <laughs> Because that would do the, you know, we're not, we're not playing table tennis the entire time, which we would be if he was just like me. And that works really, really well for for what I get out of the relationship. So yeah, I think immediately I got value, and then very clearly he was like, "This is what these are the plans. Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have that?" And then he could unpack it and push me in the right direction gently. Laura, I would love to stay on the, the topic of coaches and, and leadership, but I think we have to to dive into some of seller candy. And I, I so agree. We can carry on talking. If you're gonna edit this no, out. I... You can cut out as much as you want. <laughs> no, I wanna I wanna learn some of the best practices in cutting through seller central support and what you've learned. I've learned is hire 50 people that used to work in seller central support. That's great. <laughs> that's the best strategy. But do um, people actually work in seller central support? That's that's my first question, because oftentimes you do write a case or you try to reach out to somebody, you get a bot, you get a, a, a canned reply. So or you get a maze of prompts to try to find a contact number or have them call you. So how do you how do you navigate that to start? So, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, that's the question. Basically, uh, the, the kind of the history, as far as I understand it, you know, I've never booked inside Amazon, but this is the history that I get from our agents, is that around 2019, Amazon introduced a system called Workflow. And what it is, is basically internal wiki that the agents need to follow to hit their KPIs. And this is their process if something comes in. So they get something come in, they follow the wiki through, and that comes out with a copy and paste answer at the end of it, unless it comes to a escalate this. They get through there, they copy and paste it. They have eight minutes per ticket to answer. Otherwise they don't hit their KPI and that's about it. So we hire the people that were 
trained before 2019, so before the system got introduced, so they're actually trained to solve problems. And so they know how something should be solved. And our system is kind of, firstly, don't ask Amazon. So can it be solved with a workaround or a flat file or something without us actually having to go to support? If it can't, can we raise a case? And then from there, can we call to escalate that case to the captive team or the higher team as quickly as possible? Firstly, phrase it in a way that Amazon understands, ask to get escalated to the right people. And ideally, don't talk to Amazon ever, you know, just do flat files, work around the system. And then if we have to contact them, we call them and, you know, kind of quote, this is what we've done. We're not going to get off the phone until we get through. You know, it's super helpful. So given that limited time restriction that support agents have to get back, understanding that is super important just to be real concise in those templates that you're sending. And I'm assuming working with lots of different partners, you've templated that over time to get quick results. Yeah. I mean, I think in the last 12 months, we've done something like 11,000 tickets. So yeah, we've got a lot of history. And I was talking to a, a client, actually one I met in Australia uh, last weekend, but she's been a client for a while. And she was like, yeah, I found the secret to getting through to the captive team. She's like, she had the leadership team. She'd been on two calls and she got to the leadership team both times. And she was like, yeah, all you need to do is cry. Just, <laughs> just break down in tears on the phone. And I was like, well, so that sounds like a Eastern strategy. I'm not sure if we can employ that, deploy that across <laughs> 50 people all crying at the same time. You'll, you'll have to hire an acting coach for your team. <laughs> I, I've tried yelling. Yelling doesn't doesn't work so well. Oh, yelling doesn't work. No, you need to you need to get the onions. Really crying around. So I guess one one question I did have, just given your the extent of services you offer, as we look at as a whole, what is the biggest problem that seller candy is constantly, consistently fixing for sellers? And I can rephrase it. Maybe biggest problem in terms of like quantity of times that you're saying. Like, what is it that you're doing predominantly? So actually, I've got this data through today. Uh, interestingly, uh, for the last 7,000 tickets we surveyed, I mean, what I would, the answer I would give you is that we give our clients the seller central experience they wish they'd always had. So the, really the biggest problem that we're solving is that they don't want to deal with seller support anymore. So we have our own portal, they log in, they log their outcome, and then our team does whatever it takes to take that outcome and make it happen. Um, but for some actual data of what we do, we kind of divide everything we do on a menu, on our menu of services, which is on our website into, you know, listing and store updates, um, health issues, customer service issues, reimbursements, reimbursement issues, inactive listing issues. From the data, what the data says is that 32% of what we do are listing and store updates. I tried to do this, Amazon won't accept my update. It could be something as simple as you know, literally changing the title, changing the images, but Amazon's locked it, or it could be something as complicated as storefronts, figuring out what keywords in the listing is Amazon keeps, keeps rejecting over and over again, and then suppressing the listing. In a close second, or half, actually not even a close second, with half of that is inactive listings, suspensions, hazmat, uh, compliance, any reason for suspension, you know, that you can just tell our team, oh, this listing's been suspended, uh, figure it out, please, and fix it, and they'll do that. Health issues, then customer service issues, then reimbursements and small things after that. You came prepared. If it means anything to you. <laughs> that kind, you know what, that really mirrors, uh, we don't have numbers on this because we don't track it as, as closely as, as you, I'm assuming, but this seems to mirror what we tend to see on our end as well. Laura, I don't know if you agree. Definitely agree. And I think a, a mistake that we've also kind of made ourselves and seen over the years with seller support is like one, opening too many cases for the same issue because we get impatient and we're really just trying to push it through. And then honestly, the, the biggest thing I've seen is, especially when Amazon loves to change their policies, what they require in a document changes and we upload a document and then all of a sudden it goes into the, the black hole of Amazon where it's not accepted, but you have no idea why. Mm -hmm. uh, that I feel like that is just a pain point, especially when anything is flagged as a medical device. We've, we've run into that a, a, a few times and it's no fun. Yeah, I totally agree. Amazon's continuously changing what they want and, uh, yeah, them not telling us what the issue is, is a huge problem. And that's why sometimes our team ends up on the phone for a long time to figure these things out for our clients. Cause you know, at the end of the day, if you're a seller or an agency or an aggregator, you don't want to spend four hours on the phone with Amazon just waiting to figure out what the issue was. Yeah, exactly. Well, what I would also love to, to learn more about is how you built this team. Like, how did you go about recruiting and finding former Amazon seller support representatives? Hmm. Or is that your by secret accident? sauce? <laughs> no, no, by accident to start with. You know, we were checking out the usual places that you hire talent. 
So whether that's remote working sites, online jobs, all those type of places and advertising. And then we got a lot of applicants from good, you know, good VA applicants, people that have done things since then. And so some of these people who'd left pre-20, who'd been trained pre-2019 had obviously already left and become VAs. I interviewed them, hired them. And then as simple as good people become good people, and we don't become good people, but good people know good people. And then we financially incentivize them to refer good people. So if, if they set, if they refer, so everyone's continuously referring a lot of people. We've got go through 300 applications for every one hire or two hires or something like that. Once they pass probation, we give them a nice payout for that referral and everyone's happy. It's quite funny, actually. We've got some funny, we've got little groups. So we've got an entire band that came from a previous company. So we first, we hired one guy who was the singer. No, he was the, the bassist. And then we had the piano guy, and then now we got the singer. So now we have a band, a seller candy band, who played on live on Zoom on uh, one of the last meetups. It was amazing. They they've got a really good audio setup because they were jacked straight into the Zoom, so the audio quality was crazy good. And we have yeah, and they all got together in their local community and and played music for us. I Pretty love cool. that. Are are they putting together the umpity music of next season's podcast? That would <laughs> be a great candy. idea. But- <laughs> But they're a Filipino band, so mostly ballads. So it depends really what we're <laughs> what we're gonna have at the intro. Oh, um, <laughs> I love uh, it. Some rock too. Well, awesome. Well, so first of all, thank you so much for coming on the show today. This was super insightful. As we've all dealt with Seller Central, it it, it can just be so painful sometimes. And I love that you're basically that bridge of providing real customer service to sellers you're very pro seller uh, as amazon likes to be very pro customer and Mm. finding that balance sometimes can be a bit frustrating you know is there anything else from either your entrepreneurial journey or your experience in building out seller candy that you'd like to share with the audience I mean, there's there's so much I could share. I mean, what would you uh, what would you be interested in? I mean, I think for me, it's it's really the builds and and how to deal with some of those initial growing pains. And I think another thing I'd be interested to learn more about is who is your ideal customer and and how did you come to that conclusion? I can imagine there are probably some customers out there who are not ideal. Maybe they don't have the right expectation of what's actually possible uh, and and how you've gone about in that journey in itself. Yeah. So expectations, I guess. Uh, Basically, if someone's doing more than 25,000 a month in sales, we believe we can add continuous value to their business because we have packages that start at $550 a month um, ongoing, ongoing, and they can do unlimited tickets for that through our system. Really 25 to 50,000 a month, we found a decent clients, they tend to get everything fixed in their account within a few months, and then it's up to us to prove value after that. Um, But other businesses are scaling quickly, stay forever. So we still got a lot of the clients we've had since we started. Um, setting expectations, I think, is all about our team and how we communicate. I, as I always say to the team, you know, we're building relationships with our clients, and that's how they stay with us. Because sometimes they're super busy, sometimes they're not. And the reason that they stay with us when they're not is because we look after them. You know, It's the experience they have with our team what, through our system, on calls, through Zoom, everything like that. I, I really love what you said about we are pro-seller, whereas Amazon is pro-customer. I'm going to send that to the marketing team. So <laughs> my takeaway from the podcast... Add it, add it to the website. <laughs> yeah. About building and growing pains. I mean, mm-hmm. I think they're continuous and I don't think they're ever going to stop. As we get to one level, we hit the ceiling for that level and then I say, oh, okay, cool. So we need professional operations and we need an automated marketing funnel and we need a few other things. And then, like, okay, cool. We'll put those bits in. Now we can scale again. Well, awesome. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Where would be the best place for our listeners to find you, get in touch with you, and learn more about Seller Candy? I guess like and subscribe to this podcast. Then you can have me back on. Um, <laughs> check, you know, check, check us out on sellercandy.com. We have some really cool videos and testimonials about how the service works. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn or john at sellercandy.com. You can listen to the Amazon Strategist Show, where we have some amazing guests like Laura and maybe Todd if you would like to come on one day of course. <laughs> and yeah, just reach out. Like I'm always happy to, uh, happy to connect. I'm not always the fastest person to respond on that stuff, but reach out and I will get back to you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for your time, John. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having cool. me. 
Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Common Mistakes. If you're not yet subscribed, be sure to follow us and visit envisionhorizons.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter with all the latest Amazon news and expert advice. For Amazon sellers looking for more support, check out our Amazon brand management platform, My Horizons, and sign up for a free trial. Thanks for your support, and we'll see you on the next episode of Common Mistakes.